know it's hard yeah, not know, to interrupt, but, but it's but not what you said in the op-ed. Breathe, breathe. Are you disappointed by the likely Republican and Democratic nominee? What difference at this point does it make? We've heard so much from the Republicans and Democrats. Now it's time to hear from the Libertarians, the three top polling presidential candidates. Debate here tonight in our two-part Libertarian Presidential Forum. And now, John Stossel. Welcome to our Libertarian Forum. Tonight is the first of two debates among the Libertarian presidential candidates. Given that the presidential frontrunners, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, have huge unfavorability ratings, worse than any candidate in 30 years, it's time to hear from alternatives. So, with us tonight are the three leading libertarian candidates. And I say leading because they place first, second, and third in polling conducted by the Libertarian Party. First, former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson, then tech entrepreneur John McAfee, third, Libertarian Republic founder Austin Peterson. So, candidates, tonight's rules are simple. I or someone else will ask you a question. You get one minute to respond, 30 seconds for a follow-up response. If you go over, you'll, over your time, you'll hear this. Please don't go past your time. Before we start the questions, each candidate has an opening statement. Governor Johnson, since you were first in the early polls, you start. Well, uh, I'm Gary Johnson. Uh, I would like everyone to know that uh, I have a wonderful family. Uh, son Eric, daughter Saya, granddaughter Cora, uh, and uh, fiance, best friend Kate. Uh, Kate and I share a passion for health and wellness, and uh, it's great to be in love, and I'm in love. Uh, I've also been an entrepreneur my entire life. Uh, I was the kid that was throwing newspapers, but in college I started a one-man handyman business and actually grew that business to employ over a thousand people. Uh, money for me, business for me, has always represented freedom. I sold that business in 1999. Nobody lost their job and the business went on to new heights. In business, uh, I learned some really valuable lessons. One is the magic of uh, sharing in the profits. The other is showing up on time, uh, keeping your word. It's amazing uh, how those simple principles work. I got elected governor of New Mexico. I'd never been involved in politics before prior to getting elected governor of New Mexico. New Mexico is a state that's two to one Democrat. I got elected. I promised to bring a common sense business approach to state government. Uh, in that context, I may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. 750 veto vetoes, thousands of line item vetoes. I think it made a difference. I got reelected by a bigger margin the second time than the first time. I'm also an athlete and a an adventurer. Uh, I have climbed the highest mountain on each of the seven continents, something that uh, was a goal of mine, something that I achieved. I'm hoping to ride the divide uh, the summer, uh, next summer, if I'm not elected president. Mr. McAfee. Libertarianism is grounded in the concept of liberty. But what is liberty? Liberty means that our bodies and our minds belong to ourselves. Liberty is lost when governments decide what is right or wrong regarding what we may do with ourselves. Every law that is tried to restrict or limit personal freedoms and personal liberty has failed. Governments and countries have criminalized prostitution or homosexuality, legislated what ideas we may teach our children, have criminalized the consumption of alcohol or other drugs. And what is the result? Our war on drugs has not diminished the consumption of illegal drugs. It has merely filled our prisons with non-violent citizens and created the most powerful and brutal drug cartel in the world. Prohibition did not reduce the consumption of alcohol. It created suffering through punishment and gave rise to organized crime. And ideas, like evolution, may be offensive to some, but ideas have a life of their own and cannot be extinguished. Liberty, which is personal freedom, cannot be restricted through laws 
it can only be unjustly punished as it is expressed, giving rise to suffering throughout society. We're all libertarians on this stage, and you are libertarians here. I am hoping that this debate tonight will make clear the value of liberty in all things. The fact that liberty, its very existence, depends on privacy, and that it is the foundation of a sane and prosperous society. Mr. Peterson. Yeah. First off, thank you very much, John, and thank you to Fox Business for hosting this forum. I was born in Independence, Missouri. I was raised on a horse farm in Peculiar, just a short drive from a town called Liberty. Coincidence? I'll let you guys be the judge. I learned about economic liberty when my parents sent me out into the fields to plant chrysanthemums and sell them to the people of my small town. I learned about personal liberty from those who taught me about the golden rule. I believe that people are inherently good and that they can be trusted with freedom and that that freedom should be as expansive as possible. The role of government is to protect our liberty, not our security. That's what the Second Amendment is for. I'm the grassroots candidate with a real national campaign. I have an army of freedom ninjas at my back who have been volunteering for me and financing me the entire way. I'm the fiscally conservative candidate with zero dollars of campaign debt and I've budgeted my funds in the same manner that I would govern. I am proving that you can do more with less. I may be the youngest candidate in this race, but I'm the oldest in libertarian years. I'm the anti-establishment candidate in this anti-establishment party. I'm here to shake things up and inspire a generational liberty movement now and into the future. I believe that I'm the only candidate on this stage who can inspire a coalition of libertarians, conservatives, reasonable Democrats, and independence to win. I'm pro-life, pro-constitution, and pro-freedom. My plan is to take over the government so I can leave everyone alone. Thank you. The revolution continues. Thank you, friends. All right, on, on to questions. The, the main hits I hear about libertarians, a couple things. The first is we're naive. We're soft on terror. We don't understand the need to keep America safe. We're isolationists. Governor Johnson, you've said you would cut military spending. Why would Americans feel safe with you as president? Well, there is a very real terrorist threat out there. Uh, and to address it, we need to cut off the funding. But when it comes to military intervention, I think our military interventions have made things worse. The fact that we put troops on the ground, the fact that we drop bombs, the fact that drone flights kill thousands of innocent people, making the situation much worse. Also is the really the capriciousness, if you will, of the executive to um, engage in these military inter interventions as opposed to involving Congress. I would love to see a simplified mechanism for Congress weighing in uh, on our military intervention, something that I think is really cornerstone uh, to our system of government. M let Congress debate and discuss uh, militarily intervening. Mr. McAfee, people say libertarians are isolationists. Isolationists in terms of other nations. Um, not at all. I think, I think isolationism is taking on the role of world policemen, making us a separate entity from the rest of the world. We're the policemen and you guys are the people that we police. So no, we're not isolation, isolationists at all. We are inclusive. Um, what has created terrorism? Our interference in the affairs of foreign states, dropping bombs on families where mothers and fathers are killed or brothers and sisters. I would be angry too. You would be angry too. So it is not isolationism to say that we need to bring our troops home or that, that we need to stop interfering in the affairs of foreign nations. It is reality and practicality. Mr. Peters. You know, obviously terrorism is a threat, but we have got to resist these politicians who are going to fear monger as an excuse to take away our liberties. We have got to stand up to people who use every tragedy as an excuse to take away our constitutional rights. Now listen, Thomas Jefferson had the Islamic terrorists of his day. He still managed to fight them constitutionally. After 9-11, Congressman Ron Paul went to the Congress and asked for letters of mark and reprisal. Congress should update these letters. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution would give us powerful tools to fight ISIS in a way that doesn't involve invasion, occupation, and nation building. No matter what, if we want to defend our national security, we should only go to war with the declaration of war. The president should always obey the Constitution, and if I'm commander,
Commander-in-Chief, I promise to only go to war if it's constitutional and to obey the law. And just a, a quick, quick answer, please. When is it right to go to war? When attacked. Same. My question is, why do we have war? I mean, we, we're, we're operating People under want the to assumption kill that war is a necessity. I don't buy that. I think the president does have the power of the veto. Well, when is it right to go to war? Only if the Congress declares war constitutionally is it right when for the United States. When should Congress? If we, are, if we have a significant threat, there are, there are circumstances when the United States may go to war, but we should only do, th do so through due process. Another thing we're criticized for, libertarians are criticized for, we're soft on drugs. People think libertarian means libertine, and some say libertarians encourage drug use. Mr. McAfee, you first. What is, what is a drug? I mean, almost everyone in America drinks alcohol. This is a drug. Coffee is a drug. Or cigarettes are drugs. Um, being soft on drugs, what does that actually mean? I think what's happening now, we declared war on everything, including drugs. Why? Because certain people prefer alcohol to marijuana, or certain people prefer marijuana to heroin. What is the difference? A heroin addict's addiction is its own punishment. We don't need to punish people more. Is that being soft? No. You are responsible for the repercussions of your choices, and if you are taking drugs, you've got to live with that. Thank you, candidates and viewers. I thank you for your suggestions via social media. If more of you want to join this discussion, please follow me on Twitter at John Stossel. Use the hashtag Stossel Forum or like my Facebook page so you can post there. Coming up, questions about the size of government. What should we cut? And more about war. When should we go to war? That and much more when we return. Welcome back to our Libertarian Presidential Forum. On Facebook, Lonnie posts, people say libertarians will cut the safety net, welfare programs to non-existence. So, how would you address the welfare state? Should it be replaced? How is it not effective? What should happen? Mr. Peterson. I have a spending plan and a, and a taxing plan that would cut across the board. This is called the penny plan. And what this would do, this would put us on the path to a balanced budget. Yes, I do think that we need to cut away some of these social safety nets, but we should not do it overnight. My penny plan cuts one penny from every federal dollar across the board. If Congress decides that one program is too important, such as Medicare and Medicaid, they could make an equal corresponding cut. It also includes a balanced budget amendment. We need to force Congress to live within their means. 18% of total GDP. If the American people have to balance their checkbook, so should Congress. Right now, the, GD the debt to GDP ratio is 105%. Let's force them to stay within the law. 18 no more than 18% of GDP. Cut the budget across the board. Everybody takes a haircut. That's how we'll shrink government, and no one is going to be hurting. No one is going to be hurting, he said. People say you libertarians are not going to take care of the poor. The government has to do that. Having been governor of New Mexico, I can identify what I believe are those people that are truly in need. And if there wasn't a safety net, um, I, I think that that would be bad. I want to support those in, truly in need. But we've gone way over the line when it comes to that. I think the biggest issue facing this country right now is the fact that government is too big. It spends too much money. It taxes too much. I would be proposing a balanced budget to Congress, which would be a 20 percent reduction in federal spending. And to do that, you've got to include Medicaid, uh, Medicare, military spending. Uh, and to do that, uh, you could devolve Medicaid and Medicare to the states. In my heart of hearts, as governor of New Mexico, if the federal government would have given me Medicaid and Medicare with 20% less money, I could have delivered health care. I could have administered or seen the administration of 20% less money to deliver those services. When it comes to the military, look, a 20% reduction in the military only goes back a handful of years. Mr. McAfee, what, would you cut the welfare programs for the poor? Who will take care of the helpless? It's a very complex issue, Mr. Stossel. Let's, uh, let's look at Social Security Administration. It is the second largest drain on the federal budget at over $700 billion. And yet, everyone on Social Security paid money 
that they worked hard to earn into a system that the government promised would pay them back when they were when they were older now that is a commitment that we made as a government and as libertarians do we not meet our commitments seriously it is an obligation it's the obligations we are not meeting which is the problem uh, the very issue we send young men and women off to war saying go and risk your life and your limb for your country and when you come back without limbs well we're sorry you know we'll give you the lowest possible care this is the problem Thank you. All right, these are nice thoughts, but what specifically would you cut? Agencies, for example. The state is the great fiction through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everyone else. I would cut them all. They, they have no right to take it from us in the first place. The United States should not be in the business of charity. You are not charitable because you put a gun to someone else's head and you force them to be charitable. Charity is given from the heart. We need to get back to that. That's what made America great. We have removed the role of charity in society. Families, friends, neighbors, churches, community, society. Where is the love for one another? Government doesn't love us. That's what we need. We need to get back to a system where people can take care of one another. The Catholic Church would love to step in and do charity, but the government gets in the way. Uh, and Obamacare has destroyed our health care system. As president, I would demand that Congress send me legislation overturning the ACA on day one. Governor Johnson, you agree? Something different? Well, a couple of standouts right off the bat. Uh, the Department of Commerce. I mean, wh what promotes crony capitalism more than the Department of Commerce? I, I, um, the Department of Education. Look, here's the argument. Here's the argument. Is the federal government gives each state 11 cents out of every school dollar that every state spends. But it comes with 15 cents worth of strings attached. The federal government says you have to do A, B, C, and D, and here's 11 cents, and the states spend 15 cents to do that. Also, the Department of Education was established after Jimmy Carter, not under George Washington. What has been value added about the Department of Education since Carter did that? Nothing. Thank you, gentlemen. Coming up. Some uncomfortable personal questions for each candidate. But first, when we return, what would they do about terrorism specifically? ISIS. We're back with the three leading libertarian presidential candidates. One thing Democrats, Republicans, and liber libertarians agree on is that it's government's job to protect us from foreign threats. It's here in the Constitution. But people say libertarians won't make us safe. Uh, Mr. McAfee is president. What would you do about ISIS? Um, that's an easy answer. I'd like to first start. I didn't get a chance to say which program I would cut. I think the FDA serves a very limited purpose, and so uh, that would be the first thing I would address. What would I do about ISIS? ISIS is a problem of, of uh, intelligence gathering more than anything else. I mean, we have the capacity. Certainly, is anybody uh, doing terrorist acts inside of China or inside of Russia? No, it just doesn't happen. They are so far ahead of us from a cybersecurity standpoint, meaning intelligence gathering in the modern age. We should know well in advance before every terrorist attack on the planet, and yet we do not. We do not. Or if we do, we're not telling anybody. It's one of the greatest tragedies. We need new training. We need to, to make ourselves up to date. We are 20 years behind the Chinese and the Russians. That alone would protect us? I'm sorry? That intelligence alone would protect us? They no. want to murder us. Oh, let me, can I give you an example? Okay. Um, we have the capacity using pattern recognition without having to listen to anybody's conversation or invade anybody's privacy to determine what a terrorist cell is. They have anomalous communications. Leaders will take a different phone and throw it away every day. They use only outgoing phone calls. When a terrorist attack is about to happen, there is a, a flow from the chain of command. These things are easily identifiable in today's cyber science world. We're not applying them. I'm sorry. And so if we could protect and prevent every terrorist attack, would that not help us? Mr. Peters, uh, you said something like yeah. that. Well, I'll tell you, the first thing that I would do is I would obey the Constitution and respect the Fourth Amendment rights of American citizens. Now, 
We can we can fight ISIS. They have inspired attacks on our own homeland, such as in Garland, Texas, and they have attacked Brussels and they have murdered terrorists in Paris. So they are a sincere threat. But if we obey the Constitution and we follow the advice of the founders and we listen to Congressman Ron Paul, there are thousands of grizzled veterans that are just aching for an opportunity to do their country a favor that would be more than happy to go over there and take care of these boys for us. I trust I trust the Constitution. I trust Thomas Jefferson. I trust the founders. I believe that if we follow the law, that we can protect ourselves and secure our liberties at the same time. Mr. Johnson, uh, Governor Johnson, Senator Cruz said we should carpet bomb ISIS into oblivion. I don't know if sand can glow in the dark, but we'll find out. <laughs> Well, I think that this is the problem, is that this is how we have addressed these problems. We've addressed these problems with bombs, not our brains. We need to cut off the funding to uh, ISIS, and we need to have Congress uh, declare war on ISIS. And not that they, not that they haven't been the aggressor, uh, but uh, wh where did Al-Qaeda go? Well, gee, we cut that head off, and now we have ISIS, and when ISIS goes, uh, something else is going to arise. Look, we need to contain what's happening over in the Middle East. Uh, declaration of war from Congress and um, let's cut off their funding. A quick answer from on Twitter. Someone called Hope Bringer asks, will you end all foreign aid? Mr. McAfee. Well, again, we, we, have, we have commitments as, as a U.S. government to a number of other foreign governments that do not involve policing them. And these commitments, if made, we have to, we have to keep. I'm sorry. We do, we do have allies, and we do have enemies in this world. If you think we don't, you should look at what China has been doing to us for the past year. Took 21 million records from the Department uh, of the Office of Personnel Management. It broke into the Pentagon, the FBI, Homeland Security. We are at war with China. We are. This is a fundamental issue, and we're, we're simply not paying attention to it. So we, we have to keep our commitments to foreign nations. At the same time, we've got to stop policing the world. We can't be the world's policemen anymore. We have problems here at home. But how about foreign aid, Mr. Peterson? I do not believe in foreign aid, and if I had the power to do so, I would cut every penny of foreign aid. Mr. Johnson? Well, uh, I don't like the term all, but foreign aid, it sounds like food and medicine when the reality is really propping up a foreign government, uh, taking out one despot and giving the money to another. Uh, so uh, theoretically, yes, we should cut all foreign aid. Look, this is money we could be spending in our country as opposed to others. Coming up, abortion, gay marriage, health care, helping poor people. But next, those embarrassing personal issues a reason you may not want to vote for them. I'll bring those up next. <laughs> We're back with the first ever nationally televised libertarian presidential forum. I'm a libertarian. I say any of you would make a better president than our two current front row. <laughs> the audience agrees. But there are a couple of things that make me wonder about each of you. So, Governor Johnson, you have already run for president. You lost badly. Some people say you're too low-key to inspire people. It's like you're stoned on marijuana. <laughs> and in fact, you acknowledge you get high sometimes. I personally don't care, but a lot of Americans will. So what do you say? Two points. You're too low key and you admit using marijuana. Well, I'm one of 130 million people in that category. and. Uh... <laughs> I haven't had a drink of uh, alcohol in 29 years. I've always maintained that uh, legalizing marijuana will lead to less overall substance abuse because people will find it as such a safer alternative than all the other substances out there, uh, starting with alcohol. Uh, and with regard to getting beat last time, I want everybody to know I'm a fierce competitor. And yes, we got beat and we got beat badly. But this go around, look, at the heart of this is the Presidential Debate Commission. I'm suing the Presidential Debate Commission. This is at the heart of it. And the only way, only way a third party wins is if they are in the presidential debates, which is something that can happen being at 15% in the polls 
this election. Mr. McAfee, when I, I Google... you a hard time picking and choosing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did have to pick and choose. When I Googled you, you sound a little flaky. Uh, you went to Belize. Police there accused you of unlicensed drug manufacturing. You were a person of interest in the murder of a neighbor. You left Belize, went to Guatemala, which deported you to America. You're still technically a fugitive, though they don't seem that interested in grabbing you. <laughs> Here in America, you were arrested for driving under the influence of Xanax. Yes. Why should people trust you? Well, I mean, let's, let's, let's look at the absolute facts. Um, what, okay. What are the chances of my survival if I were actually manufacturing illegal drugs in Central America? Please. All right, if I were really doing that, I, I would have a 30-second half-life. So that's, that's issue one. Uh, and number two, I was never charged with murder and certainly not a fugitive from justice. That's an absolutely incorrect statement. You can all that check that on the web. So that's utterly false. I did indeed escape into Guatemala. Why did I have problems? I was asked for a two million dollar donation to the ruling government. I said no. E exactly one week later, my property was raided by 42 armed soldiers who shot my dog in front of my eyes, tortured me, and destroyed a half million dollars worth of my property. That was a problem I had with police. And D DUI in Tennessee. Oh, yeah, the DUI. That was the most foolish and stupid thing I've ever done. I own up to it. All right. Austin Peterson, here's my problem with you. You're 12 years old. You're not old enough <laughs> to be president. I'm 35, so I'm constitutionally eligible. <laughs> On July 4, 1776, Thomas Jefferson was 33 years old. James Madison was 25 years old. The Marquis de Lafayette was 18, and Alexander Hamilton was 18. It was young men that founded this country, yeah. and young people will restore it. <laughs> young people will take our country back. So don't hate because I'm young and pretty. <laughs> Because we will take our country back. It's the young people that are going to fight for it. Yeah. Join my campaign. All right, back to issues. Ford Fisher sent us this video. Small government Republicans who are unhappy with Republican candidates may have a very clear reason to vote Libertarian. How would you sell yourself as the Libertarian nominee to disenfranchise Democrat voters? Governor Johnson. Uh, uh, disenfranchised uh, Democrat voters, uh, the, the website I side with. Um, um, I think that everybody should get on that website, take the 36 questions, see who you pair up with. Now, I had issues with the site. I, I took the test a couple of weeks ago, and I sided with myself 90% of the time. Um, I think they've fixed that. Uh, but amazingly, the next person that I sided with was Bernie Sanders at 73%. So the initial reaction was, you got to be kidding. Then the next reaction was, I get it. I get it on the civil liberties side, on the social side, on the, on the military intervention side. Um, you know what? Um, this is a fit. Um, I advocated for legalizing marijuana. I'm the highest official to do that. Although Bernie, although Bernie rolled out of bed, I guess hit his head. I'm glad that he's now advocating for the same. But there is a real connection there. There's a real connection. You wanted to add something? Well, I just want to say that, you know, yes, Governor Johnson has stated that he does side with him on social issues. And we had a big uh, kerfuffle in Oregon last week because Governor Johnson has stated that he believes that bakers should be forced to bake wedding cakes for people that they disagree with, homosexual couples. And this is a big problem because we're running for but president is he correct as a libertarian. In quoting you? Uh, yes, but I think that if you discriminate on the basis of uh, religion, I think that that is a black hole. Look, I think you should be able to discriminate for stink or you're not wearing shoes or whatever. But I'll tell you what, if we discriminate on the basis of religion, to me, that's doing harm to a big class of people. And right should now, a, should a Jewish I baker think, be required to bake a I Nazi wedding Muslims cake? I think Muslims right now in this country... <laughs> I think business. Muslims in this country would be banned by all sorts of businesses right now because it would be the popular thing so to do. So the Jewish baker should right have to bake the cake for the Nazi wedding. That's uh, that would be my contention. Yes, and uh, the example that I cited was how about well the example I cite is how about the uh, utility uh, that 
the, the utility that is privately owned, and because it's the only um, it's the only market that I have to buy my electricity, they're going to cut me off for religious reasons. Mr. Mack, if you get a chance to weigh in there, well, you know, if if, if you're the only baker in town, it may be a problem. But but no one no one is is forcing you to buy anything or to choose one person over another. This is the issue. So why why should I be forced to do anything? if I am not harming you. And uh, am I harming you by not selling you something? No. It's, it's my choice to sell, your choice to buy. Governor Well, um, I vetoed hate crime in, uh, in, uh, in New Mexico. I mean, look, uh, prosecute me on the basis of the crime, uh, not my intention. I think that religion is a black hole in that same category. But if you're going to start discriminating against people because of religion, uh, you're going to find a whole class of people discriminated against, and you may be included in that. So it's harm to others. This betrays a fundamental lack of understanding of the free market. You have to allow the marketplace to work. The government cannot stamp out bigotry. The government is not supposed to make us into better people. That's not what the United States was founded on. The United States was founded so that we could be whatever we wanted. Now, I hate bigotry, and I would stand outside these people's store, and I would encourage a boycott. I stand up for my friends my gay, for their gay rights, and everyone should be, should be equal before the law. But let the bigots out themselves. Let's know who's going to do it. Who wants to eat a kid from someone Out of time, Austin, I get your point. Coming up, abortion, gay marriage, the death penalty, more. We're back with our libertarian presidential debate. Mr. Peterson, when you introduced yourself, you made a point of saying you're pro-life. You would have government ban abortion? The first thing that I would do is to try and find every non-coercive measure that we can to end abortion, and there are options. Ending the federal war on drugs would allow women to purchase birth control over the counter. But would you have laws on abortion? The president has no authority to enact laws on abortion. The Congress writes the law. But we should be morally pro-life. All humans deserve the same right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we should find every opportunity we can to save lives. Yeah. Want to make any points on that? Yeah, I, I think this is where Austin and I disagree, and my apologies, sir. I think that a woman's right to her own body is one of the fundamental issues in this country. Yeah. And, and more, 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 more importantly, I do not think it is the federal government's job or the state government's job to interfere in this process. Thank you. How can there be a decision more difficult than abortion, and who, uh, who should be making that decision other than the woman involved? No one. All right, lightning round. Do you support the death penalty? We'll start with you, John. Uh, it's the most barbaric thing imaginable. Awesome. Absolutely not. The government kills innocent people every year. We should put a stop to it. Governor John. No, I do not support the death penalty. Gay marriage? Any position? Gay marriage? Well, I met Austin in a gay bar. <laughs> uh, no, as, as, as long as you grant me the right to a heterosexual marriage, then you may marry who or what you please. So, I'm happy agree. whenever anyone finds love. It's a private contract. Get government out of it completely. Uh, yes, I do support marriage equality, and when you say get government out of it completely, uh, what I came to find out is that there are literally thousands of laws on the books, and you would have to go through, if you got government out of marriage, you would literally have to go through and change every single law as opposed to just recognizing marriage equality. You wouldn't have to change the word in any of these laws. Women are paid less than men. Should government be involved in fixing that? Governor Johnson. First of all, women should be paid the same as a man, equal, equal pay, equal work. Government should get involved in that? But should the devil's it? in the details, and having vetoed as many pieces of legislation that I have, I would find it, I would find it me, hard-pressed to sign that legislation. But I would keep an open mind to how that legislation got written. But I will tell you, the devil's in the details. Mr. McAfee, should government I, intervene? I, I think that people should be paid based on what they do and their talents and their productivity rather than whether you're a man or a woman or, or anything else. But who decides, government or the business? Pardon? 
Who decides, government or the business? Well, well the employee decides. Does it so not? Government I mean, there's more not than, get there's more than one business in the world. If you don't want to work for this employee, work for somebody else. <laughs> The unfortunate truth is, is that the reason why there is this, quote, uh, gender pay gap is because of women's choices. Women fall out of the workforce. They have children. They don't work as long hours. So when you look at the economic data side by side, the truth is, is that the gender pay gap closes. And now more women get more degrees and 35 years and younger, those women are actually now making more because more women are going to college than men. So, if you so should we should government force more men to get into college? The government should stay out of it. <laughs> last last question. Suppose none of you exists. You have a choice between voting for Trump or Clinton. Who? I choose to remain non-existent. Um, <laughs> I, I don't vote. I don't vote for people that I don't believe in. Mr. McAfee, lesser yeah, of you're, evils? You're, you're asking me to choose between a case of the measles and a bladder infection. I'm sorry. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know. I can't answer that. Governor Johnson? Look, I, I, would, I would vote for the libertarian candidate if none of us were up here. I would vote for a third party candidate if none of us were up here. My first vote for a libertarian candidate was uh, Berglund against Reagan, his second term. He blew the lid off of, uh, off of spending. That's the end of our first debate. The second half of this forum will air next Friday when we return tonight. Analysis of the debate so far from Fox Business host Kennedy and Reason editor Matt Welch. We've heard from the candidates, so what have we learned so far? Let's ask two smart libertarians. Kennedy, host of her own show here on Fox Business, and Matt Welch, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine. So, what do you like so far? You know, I liked all three of them in different uh, in different ways. I didn't know John McAfee that well. He came out with a lot of uh, energy. He uh, is strange in a way that I, that I, I appreciate it. I think the fundamental thing that the Libertarian Party has always been at tension is is between a sense of purity, someone who will, will completely represent this vision, purely distilled, and a sense of pragmatism, who we think can sell it to people who kind of don't know what the word libertarian means. And so I think uh, all three of them represent a different kind of poles of that. Kennedy? Matt's absolutely right. This Monmouth University poll that shows that Gary Johnson uh, could be pulling at 11 percent against Trump and Clinton, with, with Donald Trump only having 34 percent. We hadn't mentioned that yet. This is a recent poll yeah. that, that Gary Johnson won 1 percent of the vote when he ran, but he's at 11 percent against Trump. People really are clamoring for a third party. The Libertarian Party has a, a ballot on in all 50 states and I think therefore people are going to be paying much more attention to these ideas and the, the pragmatism there. We've never seen an election like this. We've never seen two front runners who are so hated as this. So you have a bunch of deserted themselves. Yeah. <laughs> if you have liberty back on the stage in these presidential debates, it completely changes the race. You've got an electorate that is so frustrated at government. And if you've got someone who can logically show how government is the cause for this frustration and limiting it will only do better, uh, it, it could be very, very interesting for liberty. All right, but too nice. My producer's telling me you guys had some complaints about some of these answers. Oh, Matt. Austin was all nervous and he was given the Rand Paul one penny line and he sounded like uh, any other politician in 25% of his answers. And and uh, and John McAfee, God, what the hell happened there? In, uh, in, uh, yeah. in Guad not, not that, you know, the guy obviously in suffered. Guatemala, uh, Guatemala in, in or Belize, God knows I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, there's a, the, and, and Gary Johnson I think stumbles a little bit when he tries to uh, explain exactly what his position is about gay Nazi cakes and about uh, <laughs> equal pay for equal work in a way that I think will rub some Libertarian Party uh, long-termers uh, the wrong way. John McAfee at times reminded me of the skeptical stoner, the guy you're stuck with at a bonfire who just keeps going, well, what are drugs? What is liberty? And it's like, you're running for president. Why don't you tell me? And uh, you know, I, I think that Austin has a, a lot of idealism and youth, but he talks in a series of bumper stickers. And uh, that can be a little annoying.
and this presidential race somehow has given us a socialist, a democratic socialist, a big government, uh, uh, much more big government than Barack Obama, a Democrat, a Trump. <laughs> so at some point, the yen for limited government, there was a Tea Party movement. I swear to God, it happened sometime recently, and it elected a lot of people like Rand Paul and other, other people who have a serious commitment to limited government. That is a real tendency, as it is on the left of people who want to get the government out of the boardroom and bedroom and, and drug room and other places that John McAfee likes to hang out. It, you know, one has been, no one has effectively been able to create a coalition of those people thus far, but we will see if there is a truly viable national libertarian candidate if they can take the people who consider themselves to be fiscally conservative uh, and socially liberal or socially awkward in the case of libertarians. <laughs> if, you know, I, I think that describes a majority of voters in this country. Thank you, Kennedy. Thank you, Matt. We have more debate coming up next Friday, the second part of this debate. More topics, immigration, privacy, global warming, plus questions from Fox News hosts like this obnoxious guy. So here's my question for the libertarian geniuses. That and more questions from Fox anchors next Friday. See you next week. I happen to think that the majority of people in this country are libertarian. They just don't know. Is that true? Are you economically conservative and socially liberal? Then you're a libertarian. It's the first nationally televised debate. In part one of our presidential forum, we heard these three libertarians debate. Gay bear. Well, I met Austin in a gay bar. <laughs> it was different from Republican and Democratic debates. Libertarians focus on getting government out of the way. I didn't create a single job. Government doesn't create jobs. The private sector does. The Second Amendment was not for hunting. The Second Amendment was to shoot at tyrants if the government becomes tyrant. All governments will eventually become corrupt. After all, look at the kinds of people who want power over you. Two kind of awful people. Two virulent statists. These alternatives would be great. Yes, each of these candidates is better than Donald or Hillary. We hear more from them now in part two of our Libertarian Presidential Forum. And now, John Stossel. Welcome back to part two of our Libertarian Presidential Forum. It's a relief to hear from libertarians after months of listening to Clinton and Trump talk about reducing our liberty. The three libertarian presidential candidates are former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson, software entrepreneur John McAfee, Libertarian Republic founder Austin Peterson. So, let's get right to it. Governor Johnson, what would you do about illegal immigration? Uh, I would um, make it as easy as possible for those illegal immigrants to get a work visa as long as they haven't committed any crimes. Agreement? Disagreement? Yeah, our country was founded on the principle of open arms. Um, you know, all of, our, all of our ancestors were immigrants, and so why are, we, why are we trying to shut our borders and keep people out? So, but they have to be documented. If I have to be documented, well then I think immigrants as well should have to be documented and made legal. I think we can incentivize legal immigration, or incentivize legal immigration so that we can cut down on illegal immigration. If we make a simpler path to citizenship, then people will not break the law if they know that there's a chance that they can Simple come here. Simple path for the 11, 12 million illegals already here? Just let them... Become yeah, they're already illegal? here. They're already adding to our economy. So why don't we make it so that they can, they can find a path to citizenship? <laughs> Because they lied to get in. It's an insult to the people who followed the rules. If you were living in a third world country and your family was starving to death, who would not cross that wall? Ooh. We have got to make it simple for them to come here because we have a policy of love towards them. <coughs> we're an immigrant nation. My last name is Peterson, spelled S-E-N. The Danish came over here through Ellis Island. We need to have a simple path to naturalization. Disease check, security check, done. Ooh. Any disagreement? 
Well, uh, the reality is is that you've got uh, Mexicans uh, in Juarez that can see jobs that exist in El Paso, uh, but they can't get across the border to take those jobs. So they have to cross illegally, and they are taking jobs that U.S. citizens don't want. Americans say they're taking our jobs. Well, that's not the case, and there, it's not an issue either of lower pay. It's lower pay when language is an issue, and they're the first ones that recognize this. We're getting the cream of the crop when it comes to workers from Mexico, and I am speaking as a border governor. What about... Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'd like to say something. You said they lied to get in, and I'm not going to claim hypocrisy. Uh, however... Who of you have not lied? Has anybody ever had an affair here? Has anybody smoked weed in a state where it's illegal and been asked by the police if you're carrying it? Come on, sir. That was an absurd statement, and I'm, I'm sorry. I have to say that. All right. Fair enough. Um, Libertarian-ish Republican Rand Paul said, we got to worry about terrorism. We should put a hold on immigration from certain parts of the world. Do you agree? Disagree? Uh, I, I disagree. I, I think that we should be taking our fair share, and I think you phrased that question just right. Uh, Rand Paul, libertarian-ish, is about half of what he has to say. I agree with wholeheartedly. Of all the Republican candidates, he was my guy, but bottom line, he's a Republican. He's not a libertarian. Any ban on Muslims coming in? You can't enforce something like that. The First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says that the government should stay out of religion, that government cannot set those kinds of standards or quotas. What are you going to do? Are you going to ask them what, they, what their religion is when they come here? That's un-American. We've got to have a simpler path of naturalization for these people because they are coming here because they want to work. When immigrants come to the United States, they don't just take jobs. They give labor. They create wealth. That's how the free market economy works, and we should encourage that. Besides, if they wanted free welfare, they would go to Europe. It's the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Here in the United States is the land of opportunity. It still is. So right, we should well, welcome the people who want to come here. Let, let's talk about that. Mr. McAfee, you've said, as did Milton Friedman, you can't have open borders and a welfare state. So you would shut the border until you took down the welfare state? Or I, I, how would you're, you do you're it? I'm agreeing with that statement to begin with, which I do not. I don't think open borders and welfare states have anything to do with one another. I think it's the attitude of the government toward its citizenry that cre creates a welfare state. But I'd like, I would like to say about letting Muslims in, um, what are we trying to protect ourselves from? Is it not ourselves? Did we not create terrorism by interfering in the affairs of foreign nations? I just want to say that you left out a part of Milton Friedman's statement there, because when he said that you can't have open borders in a welfare state, he said, then he followed up by saying that means that illegal immigration is actually superior. Why? Because then they don't qualify for benefits. So, <laughs> so if we had a simpler path to naturalization, we wouldn't have the problem, but we should build a wall around the welfare state. <laughs> Next topic, Donald Trump says he supports free trade, but only fair free trade. Uh, he says our bad deals with other countries have cost Americans jobs. That leads to a question posted on Facebook from Joe Rafferty. How will free trade help the working class by way of employment, not just lower the price of goods? Mr. Jones. Well, free, free trade. Uh, who benefits from free trade but you and I as consumers? If China wants to subsidize the goods and services that they send to the United States, who benefits? Uh, we do. And ultimately, China pays the price. Look, I think but some American workers lose jobs. Well, um, I'm advocating uh, eliminating income tax and corporate tax. And if we did that, in my opinion, along with the IRS, we would create tens of millions of jobs in this country. Because why would you locate a business anywhere in the world other than the United States, given a zero corporate tax rate? If we have a, a problem with jobs and they're not enough, it has nothing to do with free trade. It has to do with the fact that our government has placed so many barriers to entry for entrepreneurs and new businesses. I mean, if the government would get out of our way, we'd, we would have more than enough jobs for people. This is the fundamental issue. But some people lose jobs. When China subsidizes steel, some steel workers lose jobs. But well, consumers that's... benefit from, the, from lower prices. See, nobody's talking about the third party in this equation, which nobody's speaking up for, and that's the consumer. consumer. Right. When you're allowed to purchase things from overseas, you can buy things at a lower price. That lifts people out of poverty. The purchasing power. So if the Federal Reserve would stop destroying our dollars, we could buy even more. Yeah. 
Governor. No, nobody's talking about entrepreneurship in all of this. Really, the, the model of the future is Uber. It's Uber everything. It's Uber uh, uh, accountant. It's Uber doctor. Uh, it's Uber electrician. It's Uber plumber. Eliminating the middleman and allowing the person who provides the goods and services direct payment for that as opposed to having a mil uh, middleman. And it's also Airbnb uh, th that we can subsidize our own incomes. It's getting government out of the way. Oh. This, is new, this is a new approach to jobs. Presidential candidates always talk about jobs. I will be the greatest jobs president that God ever created. I tell you that. We need a president that can create jobs. Create good paying jobs. That's what they say all the time. Governor, what would you do to create jobs? In 2012, they did an analysis because Rick Perry was beating his chest over being the biggest creator of jobs. Well, they did an analysis, and guess what? It was Gary Johnson. And my response, my response then was the same as when I was governor. I didn't create a single job. Government doesn't create jobs. The private sector does. God. God. Government can create this level playing field, and I do think I contributed to that. McAfee. I, I have to, for once, agree completely with, uh, with Governor Johnson. Uh, here's the issue. Jobs are created by industry, by private business, and they are reduced when we impose barriers. When, when we impose excessive income taxes, in order to start a business, I have to fill out a thousand forms and report to OSHA. This is the fundamental problem. If we remove these barriers, our industry will take care of itself and our jobs will improve. Liberty is the opposite of license. We have got to get rid of the occupational licensing in this country. Why do you need a license to braid hair? The government has got to get out of the way. The Institute for Justice has, has been stepping into this. If the government would get out of the way, why do I need a certificate to cut hair? Ladies and gentlemen, this is ridiculous. Occupational licensing is one of the greatest threats to liberty and entrepreneurship. Having been governor and vetoed as many bills as I did, I got to tell you, I vetoed a few of those. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Right. We'll have more coming up. We thank our viewers who follow us on social media and submitted questions for the candidates. If the rest of you want to get in on this action, please follow me at Twitter at John Stossel. Use the hashtag Stossel Forum or like my Facebook page, then you can post your comment. On Twitter, one good question came from Daryl Perry. He says, why did you limit your debate to only three libertarian candidates? That that's a good question, and it's, I'll take the rap for that. It's my decision. I thought if you have too many people, you don't learn that much about any one candidate. These three seem to be the right amount to me. Candidates who placed lower in the early polls, I apologize, and I just learned that Daryl W. Perry is one of those <laughs> candidates, so sorry, Daryl. Uh, when we return, more on terrorism, privacy, weed, and pollution. Also, questions from skeptical Fox News hosts. You see the damage that heroin will be when it comes to protection Welcome back to our Libertarian Presidential Forum. Recently, the government managed to break into the iPhone used by the San Bernardino terrorist. Apple had refused to help the government, and most libertarians supported Apple. So, Fox News host Eric Bowling asks this. If an iPhone contained the exact time and date of an imminent terror attack in America, should Apple break the encryption to find out where and when that will be? Mr. McAfee is an computer expert, I go to you first. I think it's an absurd concept to think that a single telephone can predict a terrorist attack. It doesn't work that way. Um, and this well, is something... What, what this if is they some... had intelligence that Pardon? on this phone is the plan? What, they might have intelligence that said that. That's never happened, sir. I mean, I, this, is my, this is my business. We're in something I know something about. I can promise you that has never happened. It might uh, happen. I, I, I debated on CNN the FBI mouthpiece who came on and said this is an issue of privacy versus security. I go, well, maybe for you, but far more important, it's an issue of more insecurity to the American public by giving a master key to telephones. 
So, so you have to believe me, there is not a situation. Do you actually think that terrorists are going to put their plan on an iPhone? When they throw their phones away every day? No, they're smarter than this, sir. The world doesn't work that way. I wish it did. Mr. Peterson. Right, I agree with Mr. McAfee, and I'd like to add, let's remember our Jefferson, because timid men prefer the calm of despotism to the boisterous seas of liberty. And I would much rather be exposed to the inconveniences of too much liberty than of too little. This is always the argument, and there's no evidence that with all this metadata that's being collected, uh, 110 million Verizon users uh, being monitored, that there has ever been an instance of actually thwarting an act of terrorism. So this is always the question, this is always the hypothetical, but it just doesn't exist. And if we create... Uh, look, it's one thing to open up one phone, but I'm siding with Apple that they can't just do that. They're going to have to provide a master key. And if they did that, I think it could be the immediate death sentence if, got, if, if the Chinese government got a hold of that uh, at, when it comes to a lot of Chinese citizens. All right, moving on. You all support the Second Amendment, individuals' right to own a gun, but some people with criminal records, some mentally ill people get guns, some commit terrible crimes. Should there be any limit? Mr. Governor Johnson. I think we should be open to, the, to a debate and a discussion over limiting uh, guns to mentally ill. Uh, but I haven't heard an argument. Well, I haven't heard the argument. We should, we should be open to that. We should be open to it. But I got to tell you that I haven't seen it. I haven't seen uh, any argument that at some point isn't going to prevent me from getting that gun because I'm going to fail some sort of litmus test to have to do that. Don't you think that King George would have uh, declared the colonists to be mentally ill? It's the government that sets the standards. Yeah! The government has no right to take away our form of second, uh, our, our form of self-defense. It is an individual right to bear arms. We, the people, are the militia, and we should have every right to defend ourselves. I would overturn the National Firearms Act so fast your head would spin, because nobody. <laughs> Nobody should be forced to pay $200 to put a suppressor on the end of their AR-15. I built my first one last year, and I use it frequently for hunting. But the Second Amendment was not for hunting. The Second Amendment was to shoot at tyrants if the government becomes tyrannical. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone doubts my position on the Second Amendment, you've never seen a single photograph of me. Um, <laughs> But, but I'd, I'd like to say that the, the Constitution gives us the right not just to own guns. It doesn't say own guns. It says to bear arms, to carry them on our person without, without restriction. Uh, and, and Austin is right. Who makes the laws? Uh, who's going to say who is insane or who is, who is a, uh, a criminal? Someone who smokes marijuana and is sentenced to uh, 15 years in federal prison is a felony. Are they a criminal and should not be allowed a gun? We're not allowed to choose that. I'm sorry. Can we, can we get the governor on the record about what he, what he thinks the, the government should do in terms of background checks? On the record, Austin, on the record, I have always supported gun rights. I signed concealed carry in New Mexico. My, so uh, my, political, advis so my political advocacy group has been talking about right, don't limit the caliber of the... Of, don't act so crazy or we might take your guns, governor. <laughs> Who do you think should be restricted in terms of owning guns? I don't. Who do you think is mentally unstable? somebody that is mentally okay. unstable. And how would you determine that? I, I find what it role does the federal government I have find it, Are you listening? Yeah. I find it difficult <laughs> to be able to, to actually come up with a piece of legislation that would address that. That's what right. I said. We won't solve that in this segment. When we come back, a question from Dana Perino. We're back with the three leading libertarian presidential candidates. First, a question from host of The Five, Dana Perino. What should the role of the federal government be when it comes to protecting the environment? Mr. McAfee, it's something we say government should do. I'm sorry? Is that something government should do? No, Private sector can handle Let me tell you why. Because if you have a truly free market, 
then the environment will be protected by the market uh, uh, support or lack of support. Why do we have electric cars now? Not because they're mandated, but simply because people prefer them, going, I'm, I'm doing something to help the environment. So how is the government going to create anything based on science, which is constantly changing and contradicting itself? But pollution controls have made the air and the water cleaner. If I have a factory, my smoke goes to someone else's yard. I don't see how private... You, you haven't been to Detroit recently, if you think water's clean, sir. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. But, but have they? Have they indeed? I mean, catalytic converters, they have removed... Uh, the sulfides from, from the, the exhaust so that we do not have acid rain, but what have they added in terms of carcinogens in, into the air? A lot. I mean, it's a complex So you issue. would have no EPA? Pardon? You would have no environmental oh, protection have no EPA. Agency. Absolutely, sir. Mr. Peterson? The EPA are a bunch of unelected bureaucrats with assault rifles. You we would know. abolish the EPA? Well, the, the president does not have the authority to abolish anything. We have to work through Congress, and you have to obey the would Constitution. Would you ask Congress to? I would ask Congress to do so, but if they would not do it, I would ask them to relegate the EPA to their original enforcement role. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. The... The problem with the EPA is that they are originally supposed to provide scientific evidence in cases where property rights were in dispute. If the EPA is to exist, that's all they should be doing, providing scientific expertise. You know, I always say I don't believe in gun control, but I do think that we need to control the government's uses of guns. We've got to disarm the feds. All right, but no EPA, Governor Johnson? This seems like one agency that we did need. I think that government exists to protect us against individuals, groups, corporations that would do us harm. And there are polluters out there. In New Mexico, there was a mine that was polluting a river in northern New Mexico. It had been allowed to pollute for decades. My biggest uh, ace in the hole was I was going to make them a Superfund site if, in fact, they didn't come to the table because they were bad actors. If it weren't for federal EPA shutting them down, they would still be polluting that river. I put this in the, co in the context of protecting us against harm. What about global warming? Should they protect us from that? Whether global warming is true or not, government should play no role. It's not the job of the government to protect us from these things. The government, the government is actually the biggest polluter, did you know? So let's get the government out of the business of polluting. <coughs> and the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, is that, is that the, there is a scientific consensus that states that there is a warming trend. But the truth is, is that there may actually be some benefits to the warming trend. Scientists are, are good at, predict, at looking at the facts on the ground, but they're terrible at predictions. They're not Nostradamus, and they sh we shouldn't be making those kinds of policy decisions and, and beating people over the head to solve a problem. China won't come to the table, by the way. They're a big polluter. India, they're greater polluters than the United States. So what is the federal going to, government going to do to force China and India to come to the table? That's the question. Why do we have to crack down on the Americans? Why is it always we have to tax Americans? That's the problem, is that we are not even the biggest polluter, so it's hypocritical of the government to try and enact this legislation on us. Mr. McAfee. 10,000 years ago, where we're sitting now was under a mile of ice. That ice occurred over a 100-year period and disappeared just as rapidly. Our Earth has gone through unimaginable cycles and changes. I'm not saying that what we're doing is not increasing global warming, but we can't stop the warming and cooling cycle that the Earth does as it, it, as it spin wobbles around its axis. I'm sorry. So, so if you had the power, you would approve the Keystone Pipeline? But what power should we have to approve or disapprove anything of that nature? That's the issue I'm asking. Because you're assuming that we are gods as, as the government, that we have elected the smartest people and the smartest scientists. Well, we haven't, and we can't, because we cannot know that. So, no, we, don't, we should not have that power, sir. So private pipeline companies would build those things, and should they have the right of eminent domain to oh. lay the pipe? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, well, that's the other thing that no one should have the right to do, to take away my property or to, to cross my property without my permission. Absolutely not, sir. So, no, they're, 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 how would they analyze get, the issue. How would they get the right of way? Maybe they won't, and then maybe that's a good thing. They don't have their pipeline. I don't know. Let the market do its own thing, sir. Governor? Well, uh, eight years uh, as governor of New Mexico, not once did I um, uh, enact eminent domain for anything. Um, the Keystone Pipeline, I support the Keystone Pipeline, but I don't know how much of that uh, relies on eminent domain. And... Uh, 
and I'd be hard pressed uh, to uh, condemn property to see that take place. With regard to global warming, I think a great example right now is, is free markets and the fact that we don't want uh, carbon pollution. So the free market has basically bankrupted coal in yes. this country, and it's a decision that you and I have, have made. We, we don't want carbon emission. We want less of it. And a great example, like I say, right now it's playing itself out. No more coal plants are being built. Next, gambling and prostitution and drinking and more from pushy fox anchors. So here's my question for the libertarian geniuses. This is what we have to deal with here at Fox. He's got a question about drugs after the break. Welcome back to our libertarian presidential debate. Most libertarians say the drug war does much more harm than good. And that adults ought to be allowed to do to our own bodies whatever we want. And that leads many other Americans to say things like this. So here's my question for the libertarian geniuses. You see the damage that heroin is doing all over the United States. You see it because it's cheap. And the cartels in Mexico are smuggling it here with very, very little interference. Imagine if heroin and other hard drugs were legalized here and distributed here. How much damage would occur? So how can you support that? Mr. McAfee. Okay. Um, I don't know how many of you were alive in the 50s, but you could buy opium in the form of paragoric off the shelf at any pharmacy in this country. There was no opium epidemic because it was, it was, it was available uh, legally. Absolutely not. Common sense. You know, if you were going and buying paragoric and your parents found out, you'd get a whipping, which is what they used to do in the 50s. Okay, so, so by saying we're going to legalize drugs, we're going to increase the consumption, absolutely not. The reverse usually happens. Why? Because children always want to do something which is a little bit bad. With all, something that's yeah, exciting. If it's legal and, and, and you see people buying it and you have heroin addicts on the street, what is the damage that they're doing to society? That's my question. The damage they're doing is to themselves. And the damage that we do is assuming that we know what's right for you. You're going to be a better person if you stop doing heroin. Mr. Peter. Yeah, I have to say that Bill O'Reilly is being a pinhead on this one. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> You know, because drugs are illegal, that they are so dangerous. We saw this with prohibition when they were making bathtub gin. If you knew what, what kind of dosages you were taking when it came to illegal drugs, you might know what the danger is. Drug dealers, thank you. Drug dealers don't check IDs. We've spent a trillion dollars on a no-win war on drugs. Uh, one of Nixon's aides just came out recently and said that the war on drugs was meant to crack down on hippies and black people. It's ridiculous. We've got to stop this. This is where we get the violence on the border. If you guys want to have a, a more secure border, then you've got to end the war on drugs. We will be a safer, freer nation. We've got an example out there with Zurich, Switzerland, where they made uh, free heroin available. Uh, you, had to, you had to register, but you got as much heroin you, as you wanted. The idea was, was to reduce death, disease, crime, and corruption. Uh, I met with the chief of police from Zurich, Switzerland, when he came to Albuquerque for a wor worldwide drug conference in 2002. And he said, when they came out with this program in Zurich, I and all of law enforcement could not have been more opposed to this. Death, disease, crime, and corruption was going to skyrocket. I'm here to tell you that all of those things improved, and the citizens of Zurich re-upped on this program. When you realize that only 8,000 people a year die from heroin overdose and people say well that's because it's illegal well gee whiz if it were legal if it were controlled meaning quality quantity known you might not have any death and people but people will still commit suicide doing anything all right some people will get addicted so Geraldo Rivera has a related question when covering the New Hampshire political primaries the presidential primaries this year we found an epidemic of heroin abuse and overdose deaths like I had never seen before as a libertarian candidate would you be in favor of government programs to help 
the addicts, to help the addicts and stem this epidemic of overdose deaths. Mr. McAfee, government programs? Well, here's the problem. We're assuming that you can actually help a heroin addict that does not want to be helped. I mean, as a, as, as a former addict and alcoholic, I can promise you that until you hit bottom and you're ready to reach up for help, there's nothing anybody can do. Because if I want my heroin fixed, all of the goodwill in the world is nothing more than the interference of you into my life. Because you view me as something alien and improper. I'm the heroin addict, and therefore I need to be fixed. You can't do it. I've got to want to be fixed, and I've got to reach out to you first. You can't reach out to this. It, you cannot. Light, lightning round. Moving on. Should we legalize <coughs> prostitution, sex work? Governor Johnson, yes or no? Well, uh, it's more than a yes and no. Look, if you're going to engage in prostitution, where is the safest place in the world that you can do that? Well, it's Nevada. Uh, and so, yes, emp empower women, protect women from the abuses that occur with prostitution. My, uh, my wife was forced into prostitution at the age of 20 and for 10 years suffered unimaginable hardships uh, and physical abuse, mental abuse, for 10 years under a vicious pimp. I personally rescued her three and a half years ago and married her. And so my opinion is it has to be legalized, else it is the most inhuman of all things as being criminalized. Should gambling, quick answer, should gambling be legal? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. all <laughs> form. The we'll anyway. best example of crony capitalism, the licenses that get issued yes. have to do with being inside. Yes. Correct. When we return, a question from Judge Napolitano. We're back with our Libertarian Presidential Forum. Here's a question for you from senior judicial analyst, Judge Napolitano. What would you do to protect the Constitution today in an era in which no one alive has consented to it and the president regularly violates it and the Congress treats it like a blank check? Mr. Peters. Well, the question is, what did the founders mean when they meant they were leaving something to their posterity? The Constitution was a gift to us. They fought hard to, to, to restrict the power of government. He's asking, how would you protect it? Well, how would I protect it? By obeying it, by understanding it, by reading it, which I do every single day. The president has a responsibility to obey the law. The, the government is set between checks and balances. And we have to remind people that the, that the president doesn't write the law. That's the Congress's job. So I would protect the Constitution by obeying it. Uh, the, the founding fathers were smart enough to know that all governments will eventually become corrupt. This is what happens. As you gain more power, you gain more corruption. This is the facts of life. Embedded within the Constitution is the failsafe, the Constitutional Convention, which can be convened by Congress or by two-thirds majority of the states, which we're, all, all, we're already close to. So they anticipated that we would at some point need something else and gave us the option to do so through the Constitutional Convention. They were smart people. And we have reached that point. If anyone thinks our government is not insane, has not turned inward, has not invaded your privacy, and is not serving you, not serving you, and instead they are becoming your mother and your father to order you around, this is the reverse role. Governor Johnson. Governments, governments invade our privacy, but do not let us invade its privacy. This is the problem. So the Constitution has the, has the, has the means to save itself. So. Governor Johnson. Well, we should obey the Constitution, but we should recognize that we can change it. Um, if there's one thing I would change about the Constitution, it's the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, which allows the direct uh, election of U.S. senators as opposed to senators being appointed by the states. If that were the case, we would not have the biggest problem facing this country today, which is government spending. And the 16th Amendment, income tax, sorry. <laughs> and I'm advocating for the same, yes, with, with regard to eliminating the yeah. All right. Closing statement time. Each candidate gets 45 seconds. We begin with Austin Peters. My fellow Americans, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. This year we must decide if we are going to nominate a candidate who represents the future of our movement. 
or if we are content with stagnation. Now, I might just seem like an energetic youth, but in 1 Timothy it says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for believers in speech, conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all individuals, regardless of age, race, faith, non-faith, or sexuality. We're all made of the same star stuff, people, and we're all endowed with the same individual rights. May the light of liberty shine on all of humanity forever, and especially on my beloved United States of America. The McAfee. In my opening statement, I, I said I hope that through this debate you would see the value of liberty in all things. And I hope that, that in the two hours that we have been debating and, and answering these sometimes very difficult questions, you have seen that some fundamental principles are all that we need to live together in a sane and harmonious fashion. We cannot hit one another. We cannot take each other's stuff. We must keep our word, our agreements, and our contracts. And that personal privacy and personal freedom are paramount to any society in which I would want to live, and you, I hope. Governor Johnson. If you want some who, someone who will tirelessly advocate for smaller government, less taxes, more individual freedom and liberty, free markets, embracing immigration as really a good thing, a skeptic when it comes to our military interventions, term limits, ending the drug war, crony capitalism, women's equality, I'm your guy. I will relentlessly pursue all of these things with common sense that all of you will be proud of. Thank you, candidates. Good luck to you all. They now go back to the campaign trail. The Libertarian Convention will be held next month in Orlando. Uh, at that time, the party will pick its nominee. I assume it's one of these three. We hope this debate helped you decide who you would choose. And when we return, analysis from Reason Magazine's Matt Welch and Fox Business host Kennedy. Thank you. We've now heard almost two hours of debate from the Libertarian presidential candidates. Who made the best case? Let's ask two smart Libertarians, Reason Magazine editor Matt Welch, Fox Business host Kennedy. Kennedy, you first. I thought Austin made a good point that if you end the war on drugs, you'll actually make the border much more secure. Austin uh, stuck the landing, I thought, uh, really well right at the very end after making sweet love to the Constitution for a long time in the, in the founding sweet generation. Uh, My fellow Americans. 1802. Um, but uh, talking about the importance of ballot access into making the uh, Libertarian Party a lasting, uh, I mean, it already is the biggest third party by far in this country. It is the only third party going right now. I, I don't want to, to disrespect the Green Party, but it's 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 doing, oh, let's. it's doing it's doing pretty well right now. It's okay to do that. But he he made a good point with uh, with ballot access. I thought it was very interesting to note the different ways that they they agreed with each other. Right, many of the agreements. But before you go to that, it sounds like you're saying, oh, you think Austin Peterson won the debate? I'm not going to say that Austin. No, Peterson No, I don't won think Austin debate. Peterson won the debate by a long shot. Did anybody win? Somebody best. Um, I thought I thought Gary Johnson made the best practical case to a curious mainstream audience, especially when he talked about entrepreneurship. Gary, God love him. He still is a little bit tentative about believing what he believes. So it's like legalized prostitution. Yes or no? Well, it's complicated. Blah, 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 but blah, 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 blah. It's so safe and fun. Probably yes. Yeah. Whereas, whereas John McAfee, and this goes to their difference. Gary Johnson is very pragmatically kind of oriented. How far can we push this? Uh, John McAfee is like, you own your life, man. 
<laughs> and, no, but that's I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm from California. I think that's cool. Uh, he's actually re uh, making things into first principles, and he turned one of your audience members just for that. Coming out of the gate, talking about you own yourself. It is fundamental to the conception of freedom and just citizenship that you own your own body. So there's a pragmatic case to be made for libertarianism, but there's also a deep philosophical case, and I think McAfee makes that case. Uh, I also thought that that he scored points on prostitution, saying that when you criminalize prostitution you're actually creating a, a much more inhumane state. So Gary kind of hems and haws on... Uh, and on gives details. Like, he doesn't just meet the guy from Zurich. He meets him in New Mexico. Who cares? In 2012. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> but uh, at the same time, Austin Great, yeah. and, and, and uh, McAfee, I think, uh, were a bit rigid when they talked about environmental regulation. I think you were pointing yeah, out... Yeah, we're going to live question. without an EPA? Uh, I it's... mean, we probably could live without an EPA, John. Now. However, um, if you're going to make a short list of what's going to survive the libertarian bloodbath, EPA would be on that list because you have a property rights problem with pollution. Who owns the air? Yeah. Who owns the water? You got to sort that out somehow. Who and owns the federal land? I, I would be so happy if this viewpoint was out on the debate in the main stage because on yeah. whether it's... <laughs> what? This isn't the main stage? This is... A main stage, John, but a, a, a mainer stage <laughs> on, on things like Ill illegal immigration, the drug war, uh, foreign intervention, government spending, shutting things down, all of that. There is no viewpoint like this, and there won't be a viewpoint yeah. anything like this on the main stage. And we forget, we think in terms of two seconds in American political commentary here. Pretty soon, we're going to have eight consecutive months of nothing but these two kind of awful people. And we're, people are going to be desperate to have any kind of alternative. Yeah. These alternatives would be great. Yeah, no, you have two virulent statists. I mean, you have two, if we're talking about Hillary and Trump, you know, you have two people who are so invested in authoritarianism and creating more government to make themselves more powerful. It's kind of terrifying. Um, I actually thought McAfee uh, made a really good point when he was talking about Apple and how you can create more insecurity for the public when you, when you grasp at the security through government coercion. And again, that is a point that is the exact opposite of what Hillary and Donald Trump say. They're inseparable. They want the government on that phone. They want to shut down parts of the internet, both of them, not just Trump, over that. These guys wouldn't go anywhere near that kind of thing. Thank you, Matt Welch. Kennedy, that's it for the first ever televised libertarian debate, nationally televised. Hope you learned something useful. Thank you for joining us. Good night.